So, if you want to do a funny social experiment, um, let's put this picture up. Just looked really impressed and ask one of your friends or any stranger off the street or Panera or Starbucks. Go look really impressed, be like, dude, do you work out? Because let me tell you what exactly what happened next. First of all, what's gonna happen is the guy will tense up automatically. He goes, and he's gonna tell you uh, many different absurd reasons for why he looks good right now. And usually, if they actually do work out, they'll downplay it. And he'll be like this, or she'll be like this. And they'll say, oh, a workout, yeah, you know, I, I like, do like 10 push-ups a week. And you know, I mean, sh like these things just, uh, they just show up. You wanna see my veins? Or if you don't work out at all and you're just a slob, and someone says that to you, probably to, I don't know, what their incentive or motive is, you'll overplay it, you'll be like, oh, um, and they're trying to justify for why they might look good because they don't, they look in the mirror. So what they say is some ridiculous things like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what it is. I ate two donuts today instead of the usual three. Or, you know, I skipped dessert at the buffet last week. You know what? I know what it is. I drank Diet Coke the whole month when supersizing my meal. You gotta love Diet Coke. You gotta love it. I mean, people will overplay it or underplay it, whatever they want. But what does this social experiment teach you about humanity? We absolutely freaking love it when others think we're awesome. Because we know, truthfully, we're not that awesome. And most of the time, we're, tr we're working really hard to be more than just human. That's why you hit the gym, because if you're a small guy, you're gonna get smaller. If you're a big guy, you're just gonna get bigger. This is why we count calories. This is why you do over, you know, overnighters. That's why you're in your desk for long periods of time, not because you're awesome, but because you're just human trying to be awesome. Awesomeness is great, but awesomeness is not an ontological or it's not a state of being. Awesomeness in humanity is rather a production of sacrifice. You do sacrifice so you get the result of awesome. So when you walk in the street, you look like, you know, you have a nice body and you didn't do anything. You didn't do anything or you have a great job but you're just you, you, when you were born you were just a genius didn't really have to work at it I mean so we, we, we realize that when people affirm us we, we fall into this illusion that affirms a part of us that we really want to hold on to and that's the illusion of invincibility this illusion, this fantasy that maybe if we worked hard enough through discipline and achievement, we maybe can control the very destiny and the end result of our life. And this is why you sacrifice and you work hard and you're disciplined. You get into the top school, you get the butt and the chest and the legs and people notice and you're like, ah. I'm awesome. But you see, what we don't realize with this obsession in, in, in humanity and in, in, in metro areas to obtain this type of control, to obtain this type of power over, directly over our life is an attempt to actually what Iliad, Homer says in Iliad, the Achilles, we want to cover up our Achilles heel. We want to cover up our humanity so we could be more. So we could play God. So we can control our destiny. So we can control the end product. You know, they had a word for this, um, and it was really picking up steam before World War I. It was called humanism. You ever heard of it? What is humanism? Humanism 
is replacing our need for God for our need and obsession for control. Why? So we can save ourselves. We can save ourselves from being fat. We can save ourselves from being evil. We can save ourselves from being dumb. We can save ourselves from whatever. Humanism says, if you just work hard enough, we can create a perfect world. We can create a perfect life for ourselves. And no matter how much the gospel, whether you believe in Jesus at this moment or you're just investigating or on the verge of discovering who Jesus is, this struggle, this conflict exists within us, living in the city. That's why you're here. You wanna show that you're hot stuff. You wanna show that you're someone the need for validation. So what we're going to talk about today is how the Bible talks about how this sense, this struggle is totally against, comes against the grain of the gospel because in the gospel, Jesus says something really offensive. How, how many people here like it when people say offensive thing to you? Like you're dumb. Like, do you love it? Like, yeah, thanks. No, you, you don't love it. Jesus says in John 15, you can do nothing apart from me. Paul says, Jesus said to him, the same guy, the red letters, he says, my strength, Paul, is made perfect in your weakness. So the truth is, humanity, our humanity, we don't like to be human. We don't like to be weak. We want to be strong. We want to be awesome, even though we're, we know we're not. So, what we fail to realize here is that when we begin to control, this addiction to control takes present stage in our life, we forfeit the right of God being God in our lives. And we get stuck in a very small pseudo narrative. Because the last social experiment of humanism was World War I. You know what they did after World War I? What was, why did War I happen? Let's do a little bit of history lesson here. Okay, I'm a history buff, okay? So let's do War I. Why did War I actually take place? Simple, imperialism. What is imperialism? Imperialism is a manifest destiny of nations that think they're better than other people. So the whole period of imperialism was what? We're going to go, what? Colonize the heathen. Show them the right way. Show them our way. That if you put your mind to it and you work a little bit hard, you know, you can accomplish anything. You know, NBC commercial, you can do anything you put your mind to. And the star came out. You know, you remember that? And so humanism, imperialism started like this. So a whole bunch of egos in different nations started to war. And what happened? It became a huge war. And of course, in the end, Germany lost and that alliance lost. And in, in the Treaty of Versailles in Paris, when they signed it, this is what humanism does. Humanism, London felt to Walter Wilson's peril, right? The president of the United States. Listen, these terms of signing with Germany, it's, it's too egotistical. You just want to say, ha, we won. Germany, you lost, you suck. It's sort of like going to high school and getting that little kid, you know, that looks really nerdy with his glasses and spandex on and taking him and putting him in the locker and punching him in the face, you know, like just 25 times for the whole school and closing it on him. What do you think that kid is going to start thinking in the dark of that closet? He's gonna get his shotgun and he's gonna come to school next day and he's gonna kill everybody. And that kind of reminds me of Hitler, a failed artist. People didn't like his painting. So he decided, you know what? Our nation, we have something in common. We should kill everybody. So that egotistical treaty started the United Nations, right? Which was the league, what's called the League of Nations. It created another war that totally obliterated in our minds that humanism is possible, that we're good, we can save ourselves. No, yeah, I think World War II was the, the finality that human beings are not only stupid, but eagle to school without reason. After we slaughtered 11 million people, after we killed almost everybody, a whole species, a whole ethnicity, 
we decided, oh man, this is not a good idea. We need to, you know what happened? You know what the whole idea of the League of Nations is? The United Nations, you know the United Nations has, haven't accomplished anything since then? They said we need to get all the nations together so war never happens again. Oh, really? I think I could think of, I don't know, I can't, I don't have enough fingers to count all of them. So when, when we want to play God of our own universe, things tragically get ruined. And it's no different in your life and mine. And that's why the gospel comes and says, look, be honest with yourself. Yes, it's offensive. Yes, you, you want to be strong. You want to be smart, but you're not. Accept it. And you're like, that's kind of hard, Pastor Sam. Accept that you're not awesome. That God's awesome. You're not awesome. You're like, this message is very depressing today. It, it's meant to be so that the gospel can come save us, that we can't save ourselves. So today, let's look at our passage here. And we're going to talk about how we can transcend humanism or transcend this obsessive need to control everything. And if you're a control freak, which I know many of you are, this message of the gospel will blast you. It'll be great. It's marvelous for you. So there we go. So there's this guy named Zacchaeus, right? Janice read it for us. The question I have for you is that Zacchaeus was passing through, right? He was a what? A, a tax collector. Yes. Very good. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll say it together, that word. He was a what? Not just a tax collector, a... Jeez. You see, when, when someone asks you what you do on a plane, and I, I've done this, social experiments, a lot, and if I say I'm a pastor, you know, you know what they say? Oh. <laughs> they look the other way. I go, I'm a president. I'm, I'm a CEO of a company, of a media group. They go, oh. Really? When you hear the word chief executive, what do you think? Awesome. This guy is awesome. He's the alpha of his company, right? When you hear chief tax collector, it's the same type of thing. Zacchaeus was the CEO of tax corruption. He was great at ripping people off and becoming rich. Kind of parallel to Wall Street currently. You know, the, the average pay from the Wall Street CEO to the rest of the world is 300 to 1. Wow, big difference, right? I mean, so this guy is a chief tax collector and was wealthy. I mean, they didn't really have to tell us that, right? I mean, we just knew from the chief title. He was wealthy. Now, the, the, here's the problem of the passage, though. The, the question I have for you is that Zacchaeus was very successful. He was the chief executive officer, officer of his town of tax corruption. The question I have for you is what motivated him to be this successful? What got into him? You ever notice that most exec, see executives, some of them like really like successful ones, they're short. <laughs> Goldman Sachs CEO, he's bald and short. Napoleon, bald and short. Well, he had some hair. He was short, very short. What motivated Zacchaeus to the point of achieving more, not just success, but amazing success? What got under him? Simple. He was overcompensation. Because you see, he was that Jewish guy at the bar mitzvah <laughs> that didn't have a girlfriend because his narrative, his, while he was growing up, he was the short, stubby guy. The Greek word here for short, he was a short man, is stubby. <laughs> that was his name. That, that was, he was, he was like 4'11". In the United States, when you're 4'11", you get, you could get, you actually could get a handicap sign in your parking lot. Because, I mean, parking, because it takes really long for you to walk somewhere. And that's hazardous to your health. So what happens is he is a short guy. So the narrative of the story is, is he's motivated to succeed because he doesn't want to be the short, stubby guy. Because he didn't like junior high school. He didn't like high school. He hated it for a fact. He did not want to be the short guy. He wanted to be 
the rich guy. He wanted to become, almost in a sense, the boss of all bosses, so no one would dare look down at them, literally, because they usually do. And when they do look down at him, they would look down at him, but they would really look to him when they looked down at him because he was so powerful. So his need to succeed wasn't based on, I mean, really, honestly, be honest with me. I mean, finance, making money is great, but the process of making money sucks. Say amen if you get what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? It sucks, right? It, I mean, money is great. Having a lot of money wired to your bank account is great, but making money sucks. No kid, I swear to you, I mean, maybe except Warren Buffett. No kid, when he's five, says, I want to be an investment banker. That's what I want to be when I grow up. I want to make tons of money so I can buy all the toys. And no, no one wants to be, no one wants to go into finance when you're five. Why? Because finance is not fun. He, did he, when he was a little Jewish boy, I want to go into finance and be the CEO of tax corruption. That, no, that wasn't the case. That was never the case. Why he wanted to be, why he went to finance was to control, to be able to arrange his life in a way where he can take the short out of the story and he could be something else. He wanted to be, in a sense, invincible. You know what Zacchaeus reminds me of? Zacchaeus reminds me of, of a character from the Homer's play, The Iliad. A guy named Achilles. You guys know what I'm talking about? You guys all know the phrase Achilles heel. And these guys, Zacchaeus, you go, how is Zacchaeus and Achilles parallel? Except the physical parts of them. Because Achilles was awesome. He was hot. Like the hot. He was a great warrior. He was hot. But at the same time, his mom, the goddess of the sea, right? Titus, she dipped him in the river called sticks, which was supposed to what? Make you invincible. Every part of its body invincible. But I love it when Homer gives it away in the beginning, what we call foreshadowing, the tragedy that will occur, even though he's invincible almost. Even though no one could really beat him in battle or war because he's really gone 99.9%. .9%. But just the fact that his mom has to hold him by what? The heel is not dipped in water. And the author tells us from the very beginning that Achilles' life will end in tragedy, that he won't be invincible. Isn't that why Zacchaeus went into finance? Isn't that why he became wealthy? To do the exact same thing, to become invincible. But what happened in the end? He was the man he was cool, but if you read the story, and when it came to see the commotion of Jesus in his time, his limitation limited him, literally, from seeing what everybody else saw because of his height. It did not rescue him from that. So watch. So a man was there by the name Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, being a... Short man. If Zac See, you know Zacchaeus didn't tell the story because if he did, he would never put that in. Right? He was a short man. He could not say that. He, he could, when he was a kid, he could not get the girl because of his height. He was picked last in sports because of his height. And now, he could not even see Jesus. His limitation was still there because of the crowd. So he climbed a sycamore uh, fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now, this is where the gospel comes in in this story. So what happens? When what? Jesus reached a spot. I want you to say that again. Spot. I love that word there. When Jesus reached the spot. I mean, what? did Jesus know the exact location where Zacchaeus would be in his fullness of his limitation where it will be plain to see that he's not the CEO of tax corruption but actually he's just a short guy he couldn't see Jesus so he was up in a tree I mean can you imagine how ridiculous it was when Jesus reached the spot and he went like this dude what are you doing there he's like uh, uh, 
I was uh, looking for something to eat. You know, I mean, it, it must have been really ridiculous that Jesus caught Zacchaeus at the place of his weakness, a place he tried to conceal and hide all of his life. It was right there, all exposed. And in, in the same way, that's where the gospel comes in in our life. You want to be hot, you want to be awesome, you want to be smart, you do what your, whatever your pseudo-narrative, how you try to control your life to be whoever you want to be. The gospel doesn't come by that story. The gospel comes here in that spot, in your weakness, in your ugliness, in your limitation, and says this. Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. The question I have for you today is simple. None of us like being weak. None of us like the story of weakness because everybody in this room has it, right? It's this tragedy of humanity of not being a God but being human, the Achilles heel, is, it starts when you're born. When you're born, you have no veto power of the genes you receive. You don't, you can't tell your mom, mom, be smarter. Dad, you have, do not give me your bald genes. I want to be awesome. I mean, you have no choice in the genetic pool you receive. So you might be really good at math, but you're short, right? Or you might be really hot, but you think Africa is a country and you think Manhattan is the capital of New York. You know, so, or, you know, you're, you can't win in the gene pool because you can't control how you look or how smart you are. You get what you get. The tragedy starts at birth. You cannot stop your birth. Why? Because you have no control over it. So to think that you can control your own destiny and arrange things in your life so that you will never be exposed of your humanity to, in a sense, cover up your Achilles heel is delusional. That's why humanism doesn't work, because it wants to make you more than human when you, you can't ever be more than human. You're just human. And the gospel comes in power because it redeems humans. So today, what part of your humanity, what part, or, what part of your limitation in your life do you want to cover up? What pseudo-narrative, what, what is it? What, what are you overcompensating for? What is it in your life that you're trying to control so badly so no one would see it? I'm sorry, the gospel comes in power when God sees those parts and it's exposed right in the open. And Jesus says, let me come in. Let me come in through that weakness. Not through your strength, I don't really care, but there, I want to love you there. So I want to pray that the Spirit of God would show you that this would be a heated discussion in small group. Talking about your insecurity, not your strength. Because I'm sure if we had an assignment to talk about how awesome you are at something, you'd be like, yeah, well, I'm like, you know, I went to like Harvard. I'm smarter than all of you here. Ha! It's great. <laughs> You know, or, you know, you could do, we could talk about how awesome we are, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm like really athletic, you know, I was like a volleyball superstar, yeah, but what, what about the parts of the story that we're covering up? The gospel comes in power and transforms us and loves us there, but this story gets deeper, and I want to help you sort of dismantle and transcend this temptation to be more than human, this temptation that you think you can control your life. Uh, a lot of us hate our weaknesses because we know that story and we hate it. So we'll do anything we can to overcome that story, right? So let's go down here. This is what exactly Jesus addresses next. So, can we go down? Okay. So, how do you transcend humanism or the addition to control? Let's read all this together. What is it? The gospel, the very place 
we're trying to cover up. See, Jesus sees that place we want to hide from others and we want to get rid of from others. That's the only way you can actually get the gospel in your life and it change your life. Right? So that's what we talked about. Where are the places in your life that you're trying to cover up? Let God come in there and love you. Not love you for, you know, being awesome, but love you for being you. You're like, that sucks. That's the gospel. It really saves you. It doesn't save an illusion or a perception of you. It goes deep. Okay? So let's go down here. So... So, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here now I give what? Half of my possessions to the poor. Okay, so this guy, and this is a problem, this is a conflict for me. So this guy works all his life to become rich, to control his life, so he's not the short guy. Now, he gets salvation. He, Jesus comes into his life and turns his life upside down. What is wrong with him? Why is he giving all of his money away? He intentionally cheated people to get that money. Now he's going to give all that money away. So he doesn't just give half of his possessions to the poor. He goes, I, you know, if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times, and he cheated a lot of people. I will pay back four times the amount. What is going on there? So you work at, you work your whole freaking life to get this, now you need to get rid of it. And then Jesus says, Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost? Answer simple. He got a better job offer. He got what you realize about Zacchaeus is that Zacchaeus really never liked finance all that much. He liked the control that he got from it to control his life from the pain, from the hurt, from his weak story. But Jesus offered him a greater story. The story of writing some pretty cool things. Helping the poor, reconciliation with people that he cheated, and living just a, a bigger role. Now, the question I have for you then is why did Zacchaeus do this, but for most of his life, cheat people and hate on people and steal from people? Well, I think I can make a, a pretty good illustration to help you understand Zacchaeus' conflict and his freedom. Now, in grade school, three of us were candidates to play a role in a play. And in grade school, They picked three cute, round, stubby people to play the role of Frosty the Snowman. <laughs> now, I was one of the three that were candidates to play Frosty the Snowman. I hate Frosty the Snowman. I hate Frosty the Snowman, and I hate Christmas because of Frosty the Snowman. And I hate all types of Frosty the Snowman songs. Because a kid in grade school does not want to play the part of Frosty the Snowman. I want to play James Bond, G.I. Joe, Street Fighter, anybody. Don't make me emasculate a boy and tell him, congratulations, you, your role is Frosty the Snowman. And they voted too. Oh yeah, all the teachers voted. When you're in grade school, you have, you, you have to ask permission to go to the bathroom. You have, you have, it's not a democracy. You say, you won the part. Congratulations. Let me tell you, when I got that part, I did not, I, I, I told my mom I was sick. 
we had to put on 10 shows for the folks. I had to come down while they were singing the song, wearing this costume. <laughs> From all, I mean, it seemed like an eternity, and I had to jump up and down. <laughs> Grandmothers, mothers, fathers, except girls, came up to me afterwards and said, you're so cute. <laughs> My attitude during the play and during the 10 times was horrendous. I cursed everybody out. I said, and if someone came to me and said, hey, you're so cute, I was like, shut up. I had a real bad attitude. I was gonna punch a teacher out. And I, I, you know what? I didn't care for the play. I hated the play. Because my role in the play sucked. And I think for a lot of us, we feel like Frosty the Snowman. The gene pool, or whatever you were given, and the role you were playing, the weaknesses that we try to cover up, give us a role to play, and that story, we know that story really well, and we hate it. We hate that story so much, we'd rather be someone else, right? So, this is why if you do another social experiment, and Stephen Levitt does it in Super Freakonomics, and Freakonomics, and other books, this is why guys, this is why kids in the hood don't want to work at McDonald's. They'd rather rob people, kill people, and sell drugs. Why? Because they feel like the role they were given by the life they have, they hate the role. It's not very important. It sucks. When you're given a part to play in a play, and you're the tree, you're not excited for the play. But when you're given the role of the main character or a big role, you go in the mirror, and you bow, and you kneel, and you do Shakespeare. Even though you don't even like Shakespeare, because you got a big role in the play. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ comes in to our weaknesses, and you see how the gospel reconciles our weaknesses with God's power is that, you see, God has a role, a real big role that he's written for us to play. We just don't believe it. You see, Zacchaeus thought, I'm not going to be the short guy, so I'm going to hate everybody. I'm going to steal from people. They're not going to love me anyway. I'm going to be the rich guy. But you see, Zacchaeus didn't realize that the story Jesus wrote for him, the story the gospel wrote for him, was to be the big-hearted guy. The guy with the tremendous heart to give to the poor, to reconcile, to be a contributing big force for God. And you know what? When, when, when salvation came to Zacchaeus, that was salvation for him. He was free from the fear and insecurity of his life. And he realized, damn, I am awesome in Christ. I don't need this stuff anymore. And that's why the text says, today salvation has come to this house. The Son of Man came to seek and to save what? To save not who was lost, but what was lost. What was lost about Zacchaeus? The story God written for him. The role he was given in God's play. And for many of us, we think we have a very small role to play in God's part. And so we rebel. We rebel and say, no, I think my story is better than your story. Or my story is better than being my weak story. So, you know, we rebel and we do whatever we want to do so we control it. But if you want to really transcend this addiction to control, transcend this, this need for humanism, Lastly, this is the last lesson we learned from this passage. And what, what is it? God, the gospel invites us to play what? A big part in God's ultimate play. See, the gospel is, you have a big role in it. It doesn't ask you to be the tree. And I've seen it for the last 10 years. People never change. Just because you tell them, hey, God has a big plan for your life. They're like, what is it? I'm not really sure. But I know God has a big plan for your life. You're like, what do I do? I mean, I hate those questions. 
But people ask me all the time, what, what, what do I do? Do I, do I go into finance? Am I going to become a billionaire? Am I going to become a celebrity? Am I going to become a superstar? What, what, what's the big plan? You see, it doesn't change us to know that there's a play going on. Right? We're like, so what? If I'm the tree, or if I'm the donkey, right? Or if I'm Frosty the Snowman, who gives, who gives a shit to that? I, no! And I don't want to be part of that. But if we were given a big part, it would change everything. And that's what the gospel brings. It gives you a bigger role. The bigger story doesn't change anything. You have to have the bigger role. And the gospel gives us that role. Not who we're trying to pretend to be, but who we are already. And that's how the gospel is made perfect in our weakness. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It transforms everything. So, as we end today, the question I have for you then is, what kind of role do you think you have? And the last question would be, do you want that role, a bigger role God has for your life? I do. That's the journey of discovering how the gospel has lived out in our life. Let's stand and pray together. About the Father's House project, you should have got a letter. Small group leaders, I think, wrote, you know, read to you the letters. Yes, uh, the staff wanted to thank you for the first time in four years of not living like, getting to live like humans and not like animals in a zoo. It's actually worse than a zoo because when you live with six guys in one room, it gets worse than a zoo. And, uh, but to your, you know, you might be sad about it, but that zoo is finally closing. And I thank Jesus for that because I couldn't stand the zoo. It's crazy. People coming in all the time. I mean, <laughs> I would have Ahmed come to me. My bed is like a sofa. I like smell everybody. You know, I'm just like, that's disgusting, bro. I mean, I'm not going to sit on your bed ever again. You know, you know, so we're going to move in um, this coming week. I mean, it's been, you know, the thing about buildings in us, in our church. I mean, we just have a history of our buildings falling apart. You know, and when we, you know, one time we were at the current facility. We're trying to get both places, up, the top floor. And um, the landlord lied to us and never told the tenants to move out when he said he would in just, you know, three months. And it just so happened that he never said anything. And then uh, we got an eviction notice last month because um, we had a paranormal type of activity at the office where someone was, you know, going through a counseling session. And, you know, just like in the Bible, those little demons start screaming. So, you know, and, uh, that person's free, praise the Lord. But, you know, for the people, for the people upstairs, you know, they're Italian and, you know, they're superstitious. And they're like, what the, you know, what's exorcism is going on? Exorcist is going on. This house is haunted. They call the landlord. The landlord called us. This is it. You need to get out. So I thought that was pretty interesting. But the Lord told me this, the Lord told me this, this week while I was journaling. The Lord said, Sam, do you think it's a coincidence that you outgrow this place? And only 100 feet away, there's a brand new building that was being built while this was stuff was going on to carry on the mission that I'd given you. And I was like, ah, right. It doesn't feel like that sometimes. And then the building, uh, that building we thought we got was taken off the table, put back on the table, taken off the table, and then put back on the table. And now we're signing the lease. We took care of all the insurance this month, um, this week, and now we're ready to go. The carpet is coming in, and now we're ready to go. So thank you for, uh, for the pledges. Remember, I want to make it very clear, the pledges, give. If you don't give to the auto debit, give it on the third week. That's the 22nd of every month so that we'll have sufficient capital going in for the first because these people are not playing with this, right? I mean, we need to have that cash in, and we want to have that cushion. So. Make sure, if you don't do the auto debit program, you give a check or PayPal on the 22nd, or the third week of every month. Or I will come and strike you. No, I don't know what I'm going to do. But, you know, it's just an empty threat. But you know what I'm saying. That's, that's the need right now. Um, more and more people are coming to know Jesus Christ in our community. 
And I just want to um, invite you to continue telling your friends about the gospel, inviting them this morning, talking to Jesus, and getting them to really meet and bring them into the family of God. Because it's really awesome to see so many people joining God's family right now. So um, if you want to give offering today, you can go to the back. I don't know who, who does that now, but um, you can still write an envelope and write a check and, and give to God that way. Or you can give online at 1achurch.tv, which 90% of the church is now doing, which I'm glad about. So let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you that um, the gospel is real. It meets us in our weakness, in our humanness. And your power and your strength enables us to do some amazing things in this life. When we enter the story you written for us. And I want to thank you, God, for all the things that you're doing, all the conversations about Jesus right now with our friends and our family. I want to pray for this building project that it would culminate in more people coming to the family. More people meeting Jesus and coming into your family. And we want to thank you for the gospel again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys have a great week. We'll see you.